Hi, everyone, and welcome to our discussion on Zero Trust and Extreme. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with you virtually and that you've chosen to spend some time hearing about Extreme's view and approach to this buzz and hype heavy topic. This session is entitled Approaching Zero Trust for a Very Good Reason, and we hope to explain that through our discussion today. Before we move along, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tim Harrison, and I'm a Director of Technology in Extreme's Office of the CTO. My passion is to work together with our customers, partners, and our internal teams to understand their needs and to foster and promote innovative ways to meet those needs. Joining me today is Phil Swain, Chief Information Security Officer and Senior Director of Information Security at Extreme. Hey, Phil, I hope you're staying safe. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and what keeps you up at night. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, uh, as you say, I'm the CISO for Extreme Networks, responsible for all things security, yeah, back office infrastructure, uh, and I also support the PSERT process. What keeps me up at night? Security is a 24 by 7 business. We have users um, around the globe, and so there's always somebody working who, who needs some help and protection. Over to you. Awesome. Uh so folks, imagine, if you will, a utopian scenario. Uh, data is protected, communication is encrypted, identity is always affirmed, and no one ever falls for phishing emails. Um, I'm sure there's a brain in the universe where this is actually happening right now. However, that's not our reality here in this particular plane of existence. Uh, seriously though, do take a moment to think about what that utopian scenario means to you and to your environment. How difficult is it today to know what data is actually important to you and which needs to be protected? How are your users connecting to that data? Are you sure that those users are who they say they are? Are you confident that you have all the necessary visibility within your network to know where those users are going? Um, with COVID-19, our working world has been turned inside out. Uh, business continuity is no longer about getting a few critical applications running but about being able to run your entire business beyond your traditional infrastructure. Uh, consumer grade devices are now the edge of the corporate network um, instead of branch firewalls and routers. Uh, SD-WAN uh, for most users at home is actually a combination of broadband uh, connection and cellular. Uh, the VPN is now an edge port and is as critical a part of the infrastructure as the wired and wireless infrastructure in your wiring closet. Phil, how does this impact the ability to deliver security services to users? Um, security services are always fundamentally two things. They're the technology that you use to sort of do the controls, the monitoring, uh, and manage security, and then the human aspect of that, how people interface with those tools and how they react to their environment. COVID and the whole work from home just forced you know the security world to sort of take the standard processes and drivers and, and make changes a lot quicker than you normally would have done you know if an organization was thinking of moving from you know an office based to a home based organization that may have been a year in the planning and now it, it got done in you know seven days the real challenge was the human aspect where, where, where the you know, users were under so much stress of having to sort of work from home, find physical places where they're sick, closets, who knows, deal with the kids, the stress of getting ill, loved ones getting ill, you know, and also, you know, will they have a job? How will business change? I think we all totally underestimated that impact. And, you know, and obviously the bad guys use that for fishing, you know, exploits, uh, extraordinaire but tim today isn't a covid conversation it's about zero trust so let's get on with the agenda absolutely uh so today we want to introduce the concept of zero trust networking I i'm sure you've heard of it as it's become quite a buzz phrase in the industry uh, some claim to have a utopian piece of software to achieve it and you can ignore your existing infrastructure uh, some claim that if you throw out your entire network stack and buy theirs you'll be allowed into the hallowed halls of zero trust networking uh, some even believe that as long as you name the bundle Zero Trust, it will be so. Um, some of you may recall back in the mists of time, um, an operating system called Windows NT. Uh, Microsoft had announced that it had achieved C2 compliance and hence NT was secure. However, that compliance was only up to the network interface. And once it was connected, that compliance barrier was broken. 
this kind of marketing spin is what we're seeing in Zero Trust today. Uh, Zero Trust can be slapped onto any product, uh, but without understanding what it means and why it's important, it will always be just another way of redirecting your spending. Uh, so our goal today is to provide you with some simple definitions, show you the business value of Zero Trust, and to highlight how you can come on the journey together with Extreme to deliver Zero Trust concepts in your business. Uh, we're not promising a Nirvana uh, or even a magical app, but we believe that we can help you on the path. So let's start by demystifying what Zero Trust is and isn't. First, what is it? Zero Trust is a concept. It's a series of guiding principles, as NIST defines it, for workflows, system design, and operations that can improve the security posture of your environment. A network and service architecture based on Zero Trust principles is designed to explicitly enable users to access specific resources, to consistently validate that identity, and to assume that anything which is not identified and granted explicit permissions is untrusted. Having said that, absolute zero trust doesn't exist. It would mean that everyone and everything is untrusted and that no one could pass traffic on the network to resources which wouldn't be permitted to receive traffic from anyone. But that's not a reasonable, logical way to do business. There must be a fundamental trust relationship formed at some point to allow a user or device to communicate with resources. We can only approach zero trust because of the need to create an initial trust relationship with a resource and then to continually assess that trust. Zero trust means that resources are not visible to anyone without the permissions to know it exists and to access it. That includes wired and wireless network infrastructure as well as applications and users. If you're not including network infrastructure and that includes all the wired and wireless stuff in your wiring closet, you are not assessing a key element of zero trust. Now, what it isn't. Zero trust is not a single product that a vendor can sell you, which will suddenly give you a zero trust network. I know you're really passionate about this point, Phil. Absolutely, Tim. Um, as you mentioned, technically zero trust can't exist in the connected world. If you want zero trust, sell up, buy a tropical island and start fishing. You will have, only at that point will you have zero, tr uh, zero trust. For the rest of us, it's a philosophy. It's a guiding like principle. The bottom line is you have to validate the user, the data request. Are you sure the person, the system is who they say they are? And if you can validate that to a, a degree of confidence, then you take that and you navigate through the infrastructure, the network, the devices, the applications, and ultimately to the data where all, where all security is based. It's all about the data. What other myths are there about zero trust in the market today? I know that there are some that are still floating around out there. The biggest one that I, I think is out there that this is a new concept. It's not. I mean, it may be re-enabled and rebadged, but fundamentally, since we've had computers and you know people have had logins, you've been trying to validate the user's identity. Tools and how and, and the means to, to do this have changed and, and, and developed and evolved, but the concept of sort of validating the user and the identity has always been there. It's just change. So folks, keep in mind, if a vendor is selling you a solution that enables zero trust as an overlay only and not as an integrated part of the infrastructure, they're missing a major part of the point. So I hear yourself asking, what is the business value of zero trust? Why should I invest in this? We see four key points here. The first is the user experience. So users are the hardest to convince, uh, the first to experience the pain, and the last ones usually to have input. We feel that the user experience is vital to successful zero trust architecture. Making the experience simple, intuitive, and consistent continues to be key. And that's what we're hearing from users regularly regarding security and access, especially in this new normal. Simplifying the user experience leads to easier adoption, less confusion, and far better control over what resources are accessible and how they are accessed. 
we all know that there is a careful balance to be maintained between security and usability, and Zero Trust removes much of the noise of user security in support of clear policy and effective access control. Now, speaking of policy and access control, it's important to understand who your users are and how to best maintain a level of identity assurance. Uh, this often includes single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, certificates, uh, device fingerprinting, even biometrics were available. The ability to digitally accompany the user or IoT device on its journey through the network is vital to maintain that trust relationship. However, you can only reap the benefits of proper identity management if you understand your data gravity and critical data assets. While data gravity isn't explicitly zero trust, it's a vital component of your path to zero trust. Phil? Yeah, Tim, you're absolutely right. I mean, the dent, it's all about identity, about who we are. You know, we all had to log on to this presentation. You know, you, you go on Facebook, you're logging in to upload your photos. But to take a step back from computers, this isn't a computer thing. Think about, you know, we've all seen those films with all the banks on TV and, you know, the big bars and the big vault doors and, you know, the floors and the lasers. To get access to your safe deposit box, you still need to prove to the bank who you are. It's all about the identity. They can have the best controls in the world, but if you can fake your identity, you're in. So it's all about managing the identity. But I think you hit on a, a key point earlier. It's about balance. You've got to get you've got to get to the point where you're comfortable that you've reduced the risk enough. As we said earlier, you can't absolutely get there. So you know, do you have? four levels of authentication, six. You know, each one is just an incremental increase in reducing the risk at the expense of the user, the user experience. And so as an organization, you've got to get the right level of control that fits with the whole ecosystem of controls and is acceptable. It's, it's a balancing act. Mm. Yeah, fair. Uh, now, folks, you may have heard uh, Nabil showing off our fabric visibility capabilities coming in Extreme Cloud IQ. And that's a fantastic example of enabling our customers to understand where and how users gain access to applications. Without that visibility, it becomes a bit of a daunting task to trace user connections to services, to identify where Drift has impacted your security and access policies, and to audit your application and service delivery. And last but not least, when we talk about the key business drivers is compliance auditing. Um, compliance auditing can be simplified if data assets are identified and access is strictly managed from the user to the asset. Having full control over that access and the ability to visualize the connection and validate the user identity makes auditing a much clearer experience. Now, Phil, as the CISO of a publicly traded company, where are your thoughts on these keys to business value? <laughs> Where to start? I mean, it's about protecting the operations of the company and protecting the data, you know, whether it be internal confidential data, the customer's data, supply chain data, you know, our employees' data, and other mm -hmm. stakeholders' information. These are all critical for both the internal health of the company uh, just to keep, you know, keep the lights on, keep it running, but our brand, our share price, and just the trust, you know, that we want to, you know, take on board from our customers, you know, and also clearly we have contractual legal requirements to protect this data. These are all critical aspects that, you know, drive us to want to protect the data, you know, and so, you know, we've got to have user identity, we've got to have the control policies, as you've said, the visibility and compliance, and they've all got to work together at the right level and interact at the right level to allow us to sort of protect the data. And, and, and that's, that's important for all of our uh, business customers and, and users who need to understand that, you know, security is, is also very critical to their reputation and their ability to, uh, to maintain compliance. So as we look at those particular business drivers and those, those business values, it's really important to assess that and apply it to your own environment uh, to understand how that will impact your ability to continue doing business. So 
throughout the conference, you've been hearing about our roadmaps. You've been hearing about our philosophy. Uh, we've talked about fabric and cloud and machine learning and AI and security and data. And you're seeing demos of how we are delivering the effortless experience. So let's talk about how we can take the Zero Trust journey together. First, start by thinking about how Zero Trust applies to your business, as we were just talking about with Phil. How will this impact you? What is the damage if something goes wrong and there's a breach? Do you know where your data is uh, and how well is it protected? Do you know who has access to that data? From where and from what devices? With users at home connecting remotely over a VPN, they could be using an iPad, they could be using a Chromebook, they could be using a corporate laptop. Are you sure you know where they're coming from? Um, are they connecting via that home connection, uh, their, their home VPN? Are they connecting to resources over the internet without using a means of securing that connection? Can you honestly say that you trust the devices, users, and application flows crossing your networks and accessing your resources? Understanding and assessing your data assets is the first step. Limiting the attack surface is the next. Phil? Yes, I mean, all, ex all organizations exist to provide some form of product and service or a combination thereof. You know, uh, you know, and they have data that covers the supply chain, customers and staff and employees. We just talked about that. Something in that set of data is the secret sauce that makes that organization unique, better than the next organization, the differentiator. You know, it, that can be a process. It can be straight technology, you know, piece of data, you know, the ingredients to the recipe, whatever, whatever it is, you know, that's what's got to be protected. And the question is, if you don't know where that is, it makes it a lot harder. Think about it this way. Tim, you've got a car. You like to protect it. You put it in the garage when you're not using it. It's easy to protect that car. Just think when you weren't using it, it's parked somewhere in your neighborhood or estate. How easy is it then to protect it? You don't know where it is. It's the same with our data. The more we can narrow down where that data is, the easier it is to protect it. Yeah, very fair. And uh, you know, I worry about my car. Um, uh, I it, also in circumstances where it's life critical, right? Where we have uh, healthcare customers, uh, mm. and there it's yeah. it's that kind of of circumstance. You know, if your business goes down, there's millions of dollars involved. If you know something happens in a in a healthcare facility, then there's lives at risk potentially. So it's really Absolutely. really important to understand that. Absolutely, you need to know they want they need to know where that data is. They need to know it's accurate and consistent. Um, as you say, it's yeah, people's lives could be, you know, on the line for that. Absolutely. So as a buyer, it's important that you consider where you can make the best investment when starting on the zero trust journey. Um, while infrastructure may not be all that sexy, it's absolutely vital. Um, through Camilla Campbell's demystification of the fabric session and with Ed Kohler's deep dive into zero trust and extremes technologies, uh, we want you to understand how the very DNA of our business is aligned to hypersegment your wired and wireless data and to effectively make the rest of the infrastructure dark to users. This is one of our key concepts. We deliver this every day for enterprise and healthcare and government and education. High security environments trust us to deliver and we delight them every time. We live this. And now with Fabric 360, as you may have seen from Nabil's presentation, um, and also I think in Camille's, um, you will be able to visualize your services, your users and devices in a powerful and beautiful new way because the wired and wireless infrastructure is such a critical component of zero trust. And we want to make it simple and intuitive to visualize how data flows through your network. We've made it simple by creating highly secure and hyper-segmented wired and wireless networks, but now we're making it simple to visualize those networks and the services that they deliver. With our fourth gen cloud IQ services, we're providing unlimited data duration, which enables you to have collection and correlation of data 
over the lifetime of your services to help identify anomalous behavior in the network. As well, we're cloud agnostic so that you can choose which cloud works best for you. With the forthcoming availability of our next generation of cloud applications, such as air defense, control, location, you can connect, protect, manage policy, and locate your resources anywhere through Extreme Cloud IQ. These actions form the basis of identity that we've been talking about so much today. Whether it's for users, mobile devices, IoT or OT, we bring the power of our applications to help you determine whether you're extending or withdrawing trust on the network. And finally, we've talked about identity and policy as critical aspects of zero trust. You can't sit beside every one of your users or point to every IoT or OT device on your network. Extreme continues to provide a powerful suite of tools and engines to build policy and to manage identity. These engines just keep getting stronger. And with the forthcoming availability of those engines in the cloud, we can continue expanding the power of identity for zero trust to help you feel more confident that your users and device are who they say they are. Phil, any other thoughts on identity? No, as we, we've just, you know, or so much repeating it's we've got it's all about the identity the tool or solution that you add to your to your environment has really you got to ask yourself will it help me reaffirm the identity i've already established or reduce the risk or chance of misidentity and will and will this be acceptable to the end users that process of, of validation and then the ultimate thing you know to any buyer i've got to say is look does this fit your ecosystem? Will this work with the complete other security controls and operational controls that you have? Any solution's got to fit in and work together. There is no one size fits all solution. Great point, great point. Now with the COVID-19 pandemic still raging throughout the world and we're still understanding the impact of the new normal, businesses are beginning to consider what re-entry will look like. Uh, will users come flooding back into the office? Uh, will there be a realignment of business and residential real estate? Uh, will we need to reconsider what residential broadband services look like with so many users working from home or using co-working spaces? Uh, we believe that the work experience has changed for the foreseeable future, but most networks ha have been designed for users in offices with security perimeters to protect that environment. We still see that paradigm even with many of our most commonly used applications moving to SaaS. Uh, Phil, talk to me a little bit about the working from home experience. The work from home, it, and I call it a human experiment, has resulted in everyone being, <laughs> everyone's had to reconsider the unthinkable question. If you'd have taken any non-customer facing organization six months ago and asked them, you're gonna send 100% of your staff home. It just wouldn't have even understood the question. It would have been that inconceivable. But right. today, clearly, yes, you can send them home, and yes, they can be productive. So I think, you know, from a security perspective, you know, from my team and, you know, and IT operations in general, the new mantra, the new mantra is flexibility. We just need to follow the data. You know, the challenge is, you know, we all face is can the traditional tools that we've all relied on that have sort of been connected to the physical perimeter, you know, the data center, the building edge, whatever, can they cope with moving parameters, you know, perimeters, you know, and if not, how are we going to, how are we going to close that gap? Is it, can they change their functionality or can we have to implement additional or compensating controls to sort of provide us that equivalent security service, whatever? I think, you know, IT leadership, security leadership in general is going to be, you know, looking at solutions that can really supply data that's flexible and the key consistent across the organization and the operations, you know, as the new baselines are created, because I, I don't think anybody even now really knows what the baseline in six months is going to be. And so it's flexible and consistent data that's going to be the key to all this moving forward. Absolutely, I agree. That's, that's really key to our thoughts as well, because those are design goals across our entire portfolio, right? And are central to leveraging our next generation applications with XIQ. 
Uh, so folks, if you feel it's time to take a step towards zero trust, I encourage you to look at um, how to segment your traffic today. If you're using a fabric technology to segment your network, that's a fantastic way to deliver a major first step in zero trust. If you're not there yet, please reach out to us and we can help you take that first step. Um, the visibility you'll gain with Fabric 360 will help you understand where your traffic flows, uh, which user is enabled to access what resources, and to build effective policies to protect your assets. Um, start classifying your data and applications. Where is your critical data stored? Who has access to it? How is it protected? Um, consider delivering policy-based network services to the wired and wireless edge with a policy engine, um, even at a remote access concentration point for VPNs, right? Either through port-based access controls or through a fabric technology. Um, all of this can be done without impacting your existing perimeter security. So work closely with your network teams, um, as often this exposes some shadow IT uh, that has grown up uh, to work around inflexible architectures. Most importantly, understand who your users are and what they actually need to access. It takes a lot of time and patience and classifying your users can be frustrating, but the data to which they need to have access and the permissions on that data is really critical to understand and this effort will be invaluable. This process will open up some vital discussions with your security and operations teams, your corporate IT and executives about how to best protect your business. Phil? Ask yourself two questions. What am I trying to protect? And will any solution fit in with the wider control, control framework I have in place? If you can satisfy those two questions, you should be good. Awesome. Now folks, we all know that security is a challenging field, but we can help deliver solutions that enable the fundamental design goals of zero trust. Because the concepts of zero trust are defined to simplify basic principles of access, we see it as a valuable design goal for our customers um, and for your users. Uh, extreme deliver solutions which are simple, intuitive, and consistent. We will continue to do just that, and the principles of Zero Trust will help us to deliver an effortless experience to you and your users. Thank you so much, Phil. Great to see you. Love to have a, uh, have a good conversation with you about security, and uh, I didn't get a chance to get in a, a joke about phishing emails, but um, thank you so much for your time, uh, and thank every one of you for spending some of your valuable time with us today.